historically marginalized communities in international affairs. So on to the main event. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Professor Liana Chen, who's our moderator this evening. Uh, Liana Chen is Assistant Professor of Chinese Language and Literature at the George Washington University, as well as the Director of the Taiwan Education and Research Program. She holds a PhD from Stanford University and an MA from National Taiwan University. Liana is the author of Literati and Actors at Work, The Transformations of Peony Pavilion on Page and on Stage in the Ming and Qing Dynasties. Uh, and I'm so sorry for forgetting, but Liana also uh, recently uh, published a book as well. Uh, the, the, the name escapes me, I'm so sorry, but uh, Liana, if you don't mind sharing a bit about your own recent work, uh, so that our audience members can uh, ex explore all of what you have done. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Professor Liana Chen. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Liana Chen, and uh, like Richard said, I, I just published a book on uh, the Qing Dynasty Court Theater. It's titled Staging for the Emperor. A history of Qing Court Theater, 1683 to 1923. Uh, well, uh, but uh, I'm here uh, to uh, as the moderator for today's event. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all for your participation uh, in uh, today's event. So uh, today's lecture event is co-sponsored by the Taiwan Research and Education Program. Secret Center for Asian Studies and East Asian National Resource Center at GW. With today's event, we are also launching uh, the Taiwan Humanities Lecture Series, which is a major component of the newly implemented Taiwan Studies Initiative at GW. So uh, through the events and activities organized under the Taiwan Studies Initiative, we hope to enhance holistic understanding of Taiwan's history, society, culture, and politics in the DC area and also beyond uh, to prepare students, researchers, and policymakers uh, to better engage in Taiwan related issues globally. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight who is going to talk to us about his recently published award-winning book, The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory, and Identity in Modern Taiwan. Dr. Dominic Mengxuan Yang, Yang Mengxuan is Associate Professor of East Asian History in the Department of History, University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, Dr. Yang completed his PhD in the, de the Department of History, University of British Columbia in 2012. He has been a recipient of multiple awards, and, uh, among them the Jiang Jingguo Foundation grants, as well as Taiwan, uh, the Taiwan Fellowship. Dr. Yang published articles in journals such as China Perspectives, uh, Taiwan Shi Yanjiu, the Taiwan Historical Research, uh, journal of Chinese Overseas Historical Reflections and Journal of Chinese History. His first book uh, won the Memory Studies Association First Book Award in 2020, and in 2021 was selected as a finalist for uh, the International Book Award in the category of uh, History General. So for his research, Dr. Yang also received University of Missouri Provost's Outstanding Junior Faculty Research and Creative Activities Award in 2020. And he's also the first faculty member in uh, the university 
to receive this honor in uh, the award's 20 year history. So I would like you to join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Young. Well, thank you very much, Liana. And uh, it's uh, uh, both an honor and pleasure for me to be here uh, live from, uh, from Taipei, uh, from uh, Zhengzhou University in CCU, where I'm currently visiting and sort of uh, doing my research uh, on my sabbatical. Uh, now, and I also want to take this opportunity to just thank the institutions uh, in the George Washington University uh, for and the staff, the hardworking staff uh, for this talk. And also that I just learned that I am the very first speaker for the uh, Taiwan Humanities uh, Lecture Series Program which uh, the GW is starting right now. So again, uh, it is an honor and privilege and it is ab my absolute pleasure uh, to be able to speak to you uh, about my recently published book. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to start. Um, I will try to keep everything uh, within 30 minutes. Uh, so now it's about 8.40 uh, in, uh, of my time <laughs> in, in Taipei. Uh, it's, it's sort of early in the morning. But anyway, I, I just had a cup of coffee, so it should be fine. All right, I'm going to show you my, uh, put on my slides, and we will start. Okay, so I will, again, I'm Dominic Yang. I'm currently with uh, History Department, uh, University of Missouri, and I'll jump over, and this is what the book looked like, and I'll uh, jump over the awards because uh, Liana has already mentioned them. Now, what is the book about? In a nutshell, if you look at the title, yeah, it's about one of the greatest uh, migration and East, in modern East Asian history that's never been seriously studied, uh, but the great exodus from China uh, to Taiwan uh, that happened um, in mainly in 1949, but people started uh, trying to basically get out of China and go to other places pretty much all throughout the Chinese Civil War. And some of them uh, went to Hong Kong, uh, and some of them went to, you know, if the, the privileged ones well, went to the United States and other Western countries in the world, but the main uh, migrant flow move uh, from different places in China to Taiwan with the Chinese nationalist regime or Chiang Kai-shek's regime uh, between 48, 49 and the last group of migration came into Taiwan from the outer islands of uh, Southeast China, particularly from uh, the Dachan Island of Zhejiang province uh, in 1955, in early 1955. So that's the date that the, the Great Migration stopped. Now, the reason why that we really, up to this day, know very little about, uh, you know, internationally, I mean, because within Taiwan, there, there has been, um, you know, there have been studies, uh, or should I say, uh, you know, uh, so the slew of uh, oral history literature uh, since democratization. But internationally, uh, we really know very little about this history. And the reason is the, the way in which, that's one of the points that I made in the book, the way in which our understanding of the Chinese Civil War or, you know, People, some people like to call it the 1949 Chinese Communist Revolution uh, and the following Chi Taiwan China divide. This entire history has been shaped still today by you know, nationalism, revolution, and the, and the following cohort division, and ended up in what we call uh, the two China paradigm. Now, I know we have a lot of East Asian specialists here and also students that are interested in East Asia and issues uh, on Taiwan and Taiwan's relationship with China. So I don't really have to explain this, right? And I've listed, uh, you know, the, and this is really the narratives that's actually 
produced by these two warring nation states or two warring parties uh, that on 1949. And you can, these are really pretty familiar to a lot of people. And, and you will see that, well, you know, within this, what's really missing is the, well, one of the things that's, well, there are lots of things that are missing, right? But one of the thing, the main thing that are missing is the, the actual experience and lives of people going through the civil war. And in particular, the group of people that moved to Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek. Like if you look at the CCP narrative, the, the PRC narrative, and to, to still, you know, to a certain degree, it is still, is the same today that you know people went to Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek, their nationalist supporter, their Chiang Kai-shek's bandit and prisoners followers on Taiwan, and there's a small group of reactionaries that reject uh, the current of history. Right? And on Taiwan, it's a totally different thing. Uh, the Chiang Kai-shek regime in Taiwan, um, for the longest time. Um, under uh, nationalist martial law and authoritarianism really didn't want, they didn't want to talk about uh, the, the, the mass departure from China, from China, especially from the human side of things is because this will mean that they will have to discuss the collapse and the defeat, right? And that's not the position of the Nationalist Party before democracy, well, all of this before democratization, right? As we all know, it's really, uh, you know, to retake the mainland, save the people from uh, under communist tyranny and unite all of China under Sun Yat-sen three people's principle. Right? So like I said, uh, but all of this changed. So the book, uh, it's about the human exodus from China to Taiwan and the, and it's really engaging the Chinese civil war historiography and also what we call the two China paradigm and to a certain degree also the, the so-called uh, what Joseph Asher calls the revolutionary perspective that has been dominated uh, by you know, had that dominated actually modern, the, the historiography on modern China, right? We still today to a certain degree and we're influenced uh, by the narratives that actually put out by the Chinese Communist Party uh, that's still in power in China today because that's this war is the war of liberation. <laughs> it's the war with Chinese people stand up. So uh, yeah, people suffer, but they suffer because the nationalists did a lot of bad things to them. We're the ones that saved the people. But with, so so it's a it's a progressive revolution, right? But if you really look, and that's why you know there there are really not many study of Chinese civil war, especially focus on on the displacement and suffering of people. Because, well, if you talk about it, then you especially in the way in which um, the war was fought and how the refugee suffer both in China and later on Taiwan, then you're talking about, uh, you're questioning, you know, you're in a sense questioning the legitimacy of that, that war, right? When, it, the, when the, the, the civil war is actually perceived as a traumatic war, traumatic war of, of family killing family, brothers killing brother, uh, other than, um, you know, so the, 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 the revolution. <laughs> and of course, my work also intersects uh, this school of thought, new school of perspective, which I call, you know, which is called, you know, Taiwan Center History or New Taiwan History. Basically, that is to look at um, the people uh, on the on the island of Taiwan uh, through the lens of uh, really the, the the people's perspective, right? and the people's perspective themselves could be very very diverse, and they have different memories and and different traumas because of Taiwan's unique history, and so the people that I am studying and talking about, you know, in my book, they're called, you know, in the English literature, they're usually called the mainland because right, you know, they came from mainland China and after uh, World War II, especially uh, after 1949 with Chiang Kai-shek regime. But actually in Taiwan, they're called, there is this other term, they're called Wai Sheng Ren, or uh, literally translated as people coming from outside of province, outside of Taiwan province, that is. And I don't want to go too much into the the uh, the linguistic origins of the term, because I talked about it, at, you know, at length in in the book about this interesting uh, this this label 
uh, people that, and I said that, well, in a nutshell, the idea of Wai Sheng Ren, of course, it was originally in China, originated in China, right? You know, you, it, it reflects some sort of regionalism um, in, in China that we can still see today, uh, people from different places and provinces and different link, uh, lineages, you know, having beef with one another and they have very, this very distinct local identity that are tied to basically the land and their ancestral grave, right? And so, and, as, and this term is especially used in, in China during the first half of the 20th century with this, this first half is, you know, a lot of war and displacement and also um, China is going through this modernizing stage. So people are moving around, right? And there are locals or call people coming from outside the province, uh, Wai Shengren. But in the context of Taiwan, this term, you know, this, this, this label was used, but until democratization where um, the, the, this collectivity of Wai Shengren all of a sudden became this special group of people. And some, some, some would say an, a, a unique ethnic group in Taiwan that, that belongs to the new Taiwanese imagined community after democratization. Uh, but uh, even some, some of the people that we, we, we sort of Categorizes Wai Shengre won't like that idea because you know they reject Taiwanese nationalism. Some of them, not not a, not not a lot. Well, I I would say they have a very uh, different degree of uh, negotiation and and disagreement and sometimes in agreement with Taiwanese nationalism. And that's something that we that that I talked about mm -hmm. also in my book. So. Anyway, let me move on because I need to do this within uh, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, you know, so um, the so the the main keywords <clears throat> for the book, um, it's you know mostly it's you know the book won the Memory Studies Award because it extent because if it's extensive discussion of the way in which traumatic mem collective memory and social trauma. Um, traumatic memory sort of work and operates and also in relation to the theory of uh, diaspora and how we understand Chinese diaspora and all of this is related to collective identity and of course um, I don't have too much time to go into it right now because I want to really get through the, uh, the main argument and the content of the book so uh, if we then if if I time I can be I can talk more about the theoretical contributions or intervention uh, you know and and I, I think that that's the best way to, to do things because if I were to explain you know I, I will go into like you know, this the start of the study of uh, in in the in Western academia about like traumatic memory like started with 19 late 19th century like Freudian psychoanalysis and all that and how it basically later sort of branch out into different debate and then Maurice Habach came in with the uh, uh, sociological memory study so uh, I don't want to go too much into that but you know it, you know the the most important thing is that through uh, my study uh, my investigation of uh, mainlander collective trauma uh, in Taiwan and how to change over time and how you know the way in which there were multiple events that actually affect their lives in in terms of and, and that that is that sort of affect how they them and their children perceive themselves, their relationship with uh, China, their, their native place in China, and also their place of uh, residence in Taiwan. And, and, and in the end, accepting the identity of being Taiwanese, but, but not in a way that we sort of understand, <laughs> but there are uh, there, there, there just other, uh, you know, way of becoming they have a, their own way of becoming Taiwanese and that that identity is sort of situated around the history of, of 1949 as a as a collective cultural trauma so I know this all sounds very confusing and complicated but um, as we go through the chapters you'll see now um, so now let's go into the book so the uh, book at a glen so if well someone asked me that uh, if you would use one line to describe your book.
book. It's it's a history book, but it's a particular kind of history, and it's also not the conventional history. It is a history of memory, right? So I would say it's a history of mainland or collective memory through time. Although I myself don't particularly like the word collective memory, <laughs> the, the word I prefer is social memory. And again, I've you know, and for that I'm influenced by. Jeffrey Olick, uh, the sociologist who was one of the people who founded the Memory Studies Association. But anyway, again, that's too long of a discussion to, you know, know why, the, you know, but like I said, if any of you are interested in, in that topic, we can go into it during the Q&A. Now, the book, when you look at it, it's a basically a history of mainlander trauma and social memory productions. Uh, my book traced the changing traumas of displacement experienced by uh, the mainlanders, the first generation Chinese Civil War migrants in Taiwan and their Taiwan born descendants through time. And we have we do have to understand also, and, and, I, and I make this very clear in my book, um, the displacement, you know, these are a group of displaced people. They came with a lot of social trauma because you know for you know the forced to leave home family separation and also the actual trauma being being through a very sort of disrupted time in China you know the, the two wars the two big wars the civil war and before that there's eight years of refugee experience under Japanese rule right but I, I make it very clear that their displacement also displaced the local Taiwanese population who were semi-Japanese who went through the Japanese colonial rule and the local Taiwanese also, you know, sort of saw um, the mainlanders coming in, whether there are local, you know, because there are a lot of basically really low class people, especially lower class people, not low class, lower class, you know, uh, mainland Chinese, especially in the Nationalist Army, uh, those are the really bottom, and they're the one, they're the most numerous population, right? So even with all these social stratification among the mainlanders, the huge differences, you know, between social status and also provincial identities, uh, people don't see the mainlanders don't see themselves as a as a as a holistic unit or ethnic uh, unit, like I said, until democratization, we had to when they had to construct that identity, and it was the second and third Taiwan-born generation that were actually constructing that identity through the collective trauma of the Great Exodus. Right? And I already mentioned that, right? But back in the 1940s and 50s, it was really I'm trying to describe the situation where people came in and 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 all sides were traumatized. Uh, the mainlander social memory productions. Um, so I'm looking at, in particular, the mainlander social memory productions in response to different collective social traumas in different historical times, from the moment that they left China in the mid 20th century to their disappointing homecomings in China later back in Taiwan at the end of the century. So uh, you know, in 19, in late 1980s and early 19. 90s when Taiwan democratized, you know, and, and it was on the really the verge of real democratization that the process when it was taking place, uh, uh, Jiang Qingguo, the son of Chiang Kai-shek, uh, a couple months before he actually died, he already, he was already quite sick at the time, he, he made the concession saying that, okay, uh, you guys can go back, it's, if you want, if you physically go back to China, like, because before that, you know, wanted to go back to China, and wanted to have, even to have any correspondence with uh, your, your, the relative that you left, your, your parents, your, your, your sons and daughters, that was considered, uh, you know, treason. Uh, conspiring with the enemy, that's punishable by death. You are liable to, to be charged as a communist spy, right? But, or you work because you are you know, communicating with people in the mainland China, which, which now is a Chinese communist territory, right? You're colluding with the enemy to, to topple the, the, the real legitimate government in that that's still remain in Taiwan. So you can see where that trauma comes from, right? the inability to make any sort of contact and not knowing what happened. So, um, you know, to be more specific, the main argument of the main argument of the book is, of course, about the mainlander or Wai Shengren identity. And, and I said that the Taiwan born mainlanders now, so we're talking about the second and third generation that 
that were born in Taiwan. Uh, in the after democratization, in particular in the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, these people are converging on a traumatic and diasporic memory revolving around the great exodus from China. And I label this as a collective cultural trauma, the cultural trauma of the great exodus. And that's the, why the, the, the main title of the book is called The Great Exodus of China, right? And this, all the stories and the experience of displacement uh, revolving around around it. And, and that that this this memory regime or mnemonic regime also include, you know, if some of you here have very, are very familiar with uh, 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 the, the Taiwanese literature or Taiwanese cultural production, um, the, the ones that comes in to represent uh, mainlander experience in Taiwan will be uh, this group of people called the O soldiers or Lao Bing, right? <laughs> Lao Bing were like previously the lower rank uh, the the in the, the the people in the nationalist army at the at the bottom of the military hierarchy the people that I just mentioned and also Jensen uh, military dependence villages or military family villages there are a lot of these villages uh, around Taiwan today you can actually you can still go to them and there are, a lot of them are now turned into museums. There's at least one, I think, in every major cities and towns in, in Taiwan. There used to be close to 800 of them. And the military dependence village were constructed you know, because of displacement, right? Like, you know, because, you know, to, to house, for the nationals to house uh, the family of their displaced uh, military officers initially. Initially, it's for the military officers from, and they're all from China. And of course, later on, there are, there were, there were, uh, considerable number of Taiwanese in some of the uh, some of the military dependence villages because the Taiwanese women marry into these villages but uh, and again uh, the, my my there, there's this huge literature on on, on Jensen in Taiwan when it comes to mainlander studies locally in Taiwan right but then like if you read my book my book is a little bit different from from all of these other studies because like even locally in town because my because i'm doing uh the history of uh, of mainlander memory collective memory right i you know what i want to find out and and you and, and you you see this in the book it really provides an explanation as to why these two particular group of people uh the residents of jensen and also laoping became you know Th uh, begin figures that represents mainlander contemporary mainlander history and memory whereas not every mainlander family or mainlander person is a laoping or or every not every mainlander family lives in Jensen. there is this entire history of you know production um that that runs through this trajectory that i talked about that that make that happen Right. Again, that's into the details. So let's take a, a, a look at uh, the, and of course the, uh, you know, I talked about the book because, you know, the 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 reason why I, you know, the 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 issue of memory comes into my attention because you can see, you know, if you have visited Taiwan in the past 20 years and have done some extensive readings, you'll see that there is this, what we call the post-liberalization memory boom in Taiwan. And different communities are doing their own history, usually history of trauma. Uh, and in that stuff that they're not allowed to, they were not allowed to say, uh, bef you know, before the, the, the end of the nationalist authoritarian martial, you know, martial rule, right? You know, and on the Taiwanese side, we're talking about the, the trauma of the 22A, uh, the suppression of the white terror, and also for the, uh, you know, some of the LGBT communities are now coming up with their own narratives. And of course, the, uh, the indigenous people of Taiwan are now coming with their own collective history as well under Han Chinese colonization, and sort of discrimination. So, uh, and the mainlanders, you know, they are really interesting because they are, you know, they were for the longest time be considered as the, 
privileged group uh, that, you know, as a group of colonizers that came in with the Chiang Kai-shek regime. And be but before democratization, they were not so, right? So you can understand that this transition was really hard for them. And it was actually, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, one of the social traumas and displacements that I talked about. So displacement from China to Taiwan, and there are two different displacement. You know, there, are, there are two different displacement that happen in between. And then you have the, the, the trauma of yourself going back to China. And, you know, after 40 years, when you're allowed to go back and see China has changed so much under, uh, you know, 30 year ballism, that was hardly recognizable. <laughs> and you have, you have the, the people that you miss, all of them either die or they change into people that you don't really know, you understand what they're saying. And that was extremely traumatic and disorienting. They, you come in, you come back to Taiwan thinking that, okay, since I lived here for 40 years, I never considered it my home. And now basically this place should be my home. But now that's the time when Taiwan democratized and everyone in Taiwan tell you that you are a, a complice to Chiang Kai-shek's rule and you are a mainland Chinese peak and that you should go back to China. So that's the a nutshell of the entire experience. So you can see that um, this, this trajectory that I talked about. Now, I'm, I know that I probably have another five minutes left. So I'm going to skip through, um, you know, some of the comparative work that I, you know, that, that, you know, that sort of situate my work in comparison, because they're really not a lot. They're really just these couple of books in the English language scholarship on, on the mainlanders or mainlander history. And so I'm going to, you know, for the remaining time that I have, I want to take you through what's specific in each chapters and I why would I make those arguments? And it really depends on what you guys want to do during the Q&A. You want me to elaborate a little bit on specific things in, within the chapter, or you wanted me to elaborate on the main argument, or you want me to do the, uh, the, 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 the theoretical invention part, or you wanted me to show some of the, because I do have some of the, uh, the evidence, um, the methodology, you know, that I, that I, that I sort of you know, because I did this research for, for, for over 10 years um, to, to, be, to come up with this book. So anyway, um, the, the evidence that I used, the, the kind of, you know, because I because I use archival sources, I used uh, daily newspapers, I, I read a lot of uh, post-war magazines, and I also like use films, you know, novels and, and all of this, uh, this uh, theatrical plays and all of them produced by mainlanders, I, I, mainlander writers or uh, at, at different uh, creators at different times that reflect their collective memory change and their collective identity change. Uh, so anyway, if we take a look at the structure of the book, uh, there, I think there, there's uh, five substantive chapters, uh, including the introduction and an epilogue, and there are seven chapters. Uh, in these uh, uh, five uh, sets, you know, sort of main body chapters, I talked about different mainlander social traumas. And there, there is this particular idea that I develop. I call them the, the rise of fall of three mnemonic regimes. And I use the word salience because that's important because when you when you when you try to talk to people about collective memory, I mean a lot of that's why I don't like the word collective memory. They're like ah, you know, yeah, you see people trying to remember these things, but they also remember all these other things at the same time, and none, and none, you know, even within the same memory group, you know, no one individual is the same. They all have their own different memories. So, and I, I said, yeah, that's true. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that people are thinking the same or have the same memory. I'm saying that, you know, they, they at, at a certain point in time, all, you know, all of a sudden, certain part of their memory that can be sort of common experience that bring them together and that they would like to produce it because it means something to them, right? For example, like uh, everyone gets to Taiwan differently for 1949, right? Some people, they didn't, they, 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 they had it relatively good. Some people went through like wars and, you know, seeing their family members shot dead in front of them or like drop into the sea before they came. That was extremely traumatic, right? But, but some of the uh, uh, high, high ranking people, they, you know, they just have their luck is stuck in a plane and then all the gold and just came to Taiwan in style, right? They're not, traumatized in, a, in, in, a, in an individual sense, but then later on when there's collective memory production, that, that history becomes a collective social trauma, if you can understand what I'm talking about. Now, 
chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, you can see that, you know, they, they're these different historical period that I said that the mainlanders because of their changing conditions of displacement, changing conditions of displacement, and, and these changing conditions of displacement produce different social traumas at different times. And the mainlanders collectively, they came up with uh, different ways of remembering uh, to help them deal with the social trauma of displacement. And so I'll just say it very simply, the, the memory regime or the mnemonic regime of 1949, which is now so important for the second and third generation mainlanders were relatively unimportant <laughs> for the first generation of migrants, for their parents uh, in the 1950s, because 1950 is about getting back to China and there's still high hopes of getting back to China. And pe people often ask me like, why would you say that? I mean, they, they, they can't, you know, you know, people can see uh, from the outside can see the impossibility of Chiang Kai-shek's regime retaking re China. But I think in a lot in the minds of a lot of the mainlanders, the idea is that hey, you know what? Uh, during the resistance war, we're in Chongqing, we're in Kunming, we're in all these marginal places in China, living with the locals in which we don't speak their language. That was a refugee experience that they still remember, and that's the refugee experience that was so recent and was still it has a lot of meaning for them in the 1950s, right? <clears throat> because you didn't know what's going to happen in the future, right? And the situation is just as hopeless during the resistance war, and it was tra as traumatic. But the resistance war has meaning in the 1950s because in the end, you got to go home. China was victorious you know, because Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, right? You, you never know what's going to happen, right? And, but, you know, but after a certain period of time, the reality starts to set in. And I said that happened in the 60s and 80s. And that's where another memory regime set in. And I said, you know, that's called the social trauma of diminishing hope diminution of a return, right? And what I said in, it sets up all the entire cultural project based on provinces, okay? Not, not, not the entire mainland, but, you know, the Shandong people will be doing the Shandong historical thing, and Shandong cuisine, and, and, and I have all these magazines that they published during this time. This, these magazines didn't exist <laughs> during the first decade of the exiles, right? But uh, the, the, this cultural, provincial cultural movement started and the put, people put so much information into these uh, magazines. And you know what? Most of the member, most of the, the information is from your memory, right? What I can remember about my home. Okay, so, um, and then the long row home chapter, it's about, you know, they're finally, can't go back. You're being nostalgic about your, home for several decades, including two decades of cultural nostalgia, right? But then, <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of tearful reunions, a lot of emotions, but then two sides quickly found out that they have become complete strangers, especially mainlanders. That was extremely traumatic. Become completely complete strangers in a place that you consider your home for the longest time and that want you that you want to return to all your life, what you tell your children about, how good it is. And when, this, when the Taiwan born mainland is the second generation and some of the, the older, I don't know if you call them older third generation, but, uh, but they're still kids when they went back to with their grandparents in China. And they're like, this is not home. Like, it's not like you describe, right? I mean, we are, you know, Republic of China on Taiwan person. We're not PRC person. That's very sure. Uh, and and that that shattering. And, and again, and when they get back to Taiwan, it's like, okay, now, you know, we, we, we're we still going to visit gra grandma in China, you know, from time to time, we still have relatives here. I and mean, we still have, want to have a good relationship with China. But you know what, we're kind of like, uh, we're, we're now on this side. Uh, and that's the time when the entire Taiwanese the, the, the rest of Taiwan started to reject them. And that really filled them, that, that really made, you know, created this kind of, a new kind of social displacement for them, right? And this is the time when this, and especially the second and third generation now coming into, uh, now, now, now in, this, in their 30s and, the, you know, 20s, 30s and 40s, and now they have become the main force of memory productions in Taiwan. And, it, and, and it's, it's quite interesting that, you know, if you look at chapter three in the 1960s and 70s, the reason why the first generation 
mainlanders uh, try so hard to sort of produce these uh, locally based memories, like what's what home cuisine like, what our hometowns are like, uh, what Sichuan province history is like uh, within the larger Chinese history. They want to give this this memory and this identity to their children. Right? Don't forget you're from you're from Sichuan province. You're from Chengdu, right? You are Chengdu person, right? But that's not the memory that the second and third generation Taiwanese, uh, mainlander Taiwanese accepted. Instead, after democratization, because of all this dynamic that I talked about, they started to construct a, a kind of a new identity and, 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 and that, that, that will fit them into Taiwan. And that's based on, again, the collective uh, tra traumatic experience of their parents and grand their parents and grandparents generation and that collective traumatic experience was based on the great exodus uh, from China. So I will just end here and that should still give us enough time for discussion. So thank you guys very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the Q and A's. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Yang. Uh, I would like to now invite our, um, our participants. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask uh, Dr. Yang, uh, please enter uh, your question uh, in the chat box uh, and I will ask you a question on your behalf. Please uh, make sure that you include your name uh, and uh, your affiliation uh, in your questions so that we can uh, keep a, a track of all the questions that are, are, are being raised. Um, and uh, so if I may abuse uh, my, my role as a moderator uh, to ask uh, the, the first, for, uh, first couple of questions, uh, I, 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 I do have, uh, and I am reading um, uh, your book, uh, well, as, as I, I was listening to uh, uh, your talk, I was also reflecting upon my own experience growing up as a kid. Okay, in Taiwan, uh, my mother is Hakka, my father Taiwanese, and I also still remember uh, how my grandfather told me that he almost became a victim of the February, uh, 20, uh, during the February 28 event, uh, the, the incident. So, so uh, I think when, you know, and so this uh, experience or, or you know, uh, listening to, to people's recounting these uh, stories definitely hit close to home. Uh, and I wonder you as a researcher while conducting research in Taiwan, you, you uh, inevitably have, to consider your own position, right? Because you are in it, you, you are part of it. Uh, so, so I would like to quote uh, something you write. You, you said that, especially towards uh, uh, the end of your book, you said that there is a possibility, I'm quoting you, uh, of finding empathy, reconciliation, and justice. Uh, and this possibility arises from a historically informed understanding of traumatic and diasporic memories. Uh, so uh, that, that put them in proper perspective. So I was wondering if uh, since we, uh, I, I really would love uh, us to, to uh, cover uh, to a greater extent uh, all the chapters. So if you would love to uh, comment on, on this positioning uh, that you, you came up with. Yeah, thank you very much, Liana, for asking this question, because you are absolutely right. That's due to the time limit. That's part of the book, um, the very last part, which I really do not have time to cover in my talk. And the thing is, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different dimension to other part of the book, right? Because in other parts of the book, I'd be mainly talking about like uh, the history itself and try to construct an argument, right? But in the very end, um, I sort of reveal my own subject position, like who my family, like I, I came from not a mainlander family, but a local Taiwanese, um, a, a Hoklo family. And not only that, uh, my grandparents' generation, we were actual victims of the 228, right? So we should be like our family tradition is like, we really don't like the mainlanders and still, um, but the reason why I, I, I wanna talk about 
my subject position and also the relationship between these traumatic narrative and the idea that we should look at it um, with with empathy, but at the same time also be very critical of it, of the the construction of it, of the the social forces and the social elements behind it, right? Is to is to to do two things, you know, basically, you know, state the importance of um, you know people reflecting on their own subject position when they talked about uh, when they construct uh, or when they, when they write a, a history, like you know, either it's it's academic work or any kind of online content or or urge, or, or a book or or a, 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 or a fictional work, theatrical play, about any traumatic experience. And, and one should, you know, maybe one is not really involved, uh, but even, even that you have some sort of implication and you have some sort of you know, ethical or moral points you want to make, right? You really want to think about that. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, traumatic narrative have this kind of emotional power that you know it gets people to think you know in you know sort of emotional terms black and white terms without without you know seeing and, and like i am the reason why i try to really where you know sort of raise this kind of awareness is that i think a lot of historians uh, i mean that includes the one in taiwan and, and, and worldwide when they do this kind of history they really don't sometimes don't think about their relationship with the with the traumatic memory and the history that they're producing and what kind of goal they want to achieve by producing like like i state that very clear my you know my goal to producing this work it's always about uh, reconciliation right it's about really thinking about deeply the the problem the the tension and the problematic between uh, what people remember uh, right now and also at different time against the larger actual historical terrain that our that that historical methodology can show you right and, and to to have people you know and, and then this is especially useful for a place like Taiwan where people have conflicting historical memories they have different readings of the past mm -hmm. and also like you know like like uh, Professor Chan also comes from a, a sort of a native, what we call a native Taiwanese family, although mm -hmm. I don't like the word native. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I talked about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. The only natives are really the indigenous <laughs> people. But anyway, um, the, the, the thing is like, you know, like, you know, she, of course you understand all these, um, the, the conflicts and emotions involving different mm -hmm. interpretations of Taiwanese history that's now still going on today, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Okay, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for the question. Yeah, it's a really good yeah. question. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that you, you not only uh, draw, I mean, it's a very important aspect, a dimension of it, the temporal aspect of, uh, you know, how these uh, memories are, are constructed, constructed and, and reshaped and reformulated, but also you draw uh, our attention to the various um, uh, spatial dimensions uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, these uh, traumatic, um, uh, well, these social traumas uh, uh, were, were formulated. So mm -hmm. uh, our questions are pouring in, and I have exactly a question. You know, when I, when, when I teach uh, a Taiwanese literature and film, we inevitably have to encounter, uh, the, uh, have sort of uh, have to introduce the idea of military village. And we have a, a, a question regarding uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, enclave and historically late, uh, loaded uh, un uh, enclave. So I would like to begin with uh, uh, this question uh, by uh, Jeffrey Kuo from uh, GW Economics. Mm -hmm. uh, he said he's wondering, what do you think about how this memory of the Melanders and Exodus from China shaped the modern Taiwanese ideology in the politics? And more specifically, uh, for those growing up in the military village or the second, third generation of the Melanders, would they be more leaning to identify themselves as Taiwanese? And if you could touch on why or why not, uh, will be highly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jeffrey. Um, it's another really uh, wonderful and insightful question. Now, I guess what you're asking is, you know, the 
difficulty of um, identifying as mainlanders or the idea of main, the, 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 this collectivity as a mainlander uh, in contemporary Taiwanese politics. You know, what I, you know, how they, they you know, so, so one dimension of it is that um, there is this saying that um, the, because the mainlander community, and that includes the first, the still, well, not, not many first generations survive, you know, right now, but the second and third, uh, because the way in which they constructed their identity, you know, you know, and I argue that's that's very different at different times, right? But despite that, there's still this thinking that uh, because the how the way in which they constructed identities is so much connected to the Chinese Civil War, and because you know that's that's what shaped their their entire lives, right? So they are in 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 certain way you know want unification with China or at least want some kind of re reconciliation with the People's Republic of China, and that makes them sort of dangerous elements and, and enemies within. Uh, I, I think that's one of the the thing the myth. I think this is a myth I try to dispel. Although yes, you do have you know people that are you know, radically, you know, sort of want uh, pro-unification, but that's that that's not limited to the mainlander populations, right? even with the, the native Taiwanese or even some of the indigenous people who have indigenous, or, or we know that they're that descend from indigenous population is still because of the, the KMT ideology that, that they were taught when they're growing up. We're, we're talking about the, uh, you know, pre martial law generation, they still hold this ideology. So I, I always think that's a very, um, you know, unfair, you know, sort of interpretation. And also, and, 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 but I think this kind of thinking continue to influence um, Taiwanese politics, especially when it comes to like electoral politics, right? And, and I would say that, and especially, of course, the Green Camp uh, will use this sort of ideology against, um, the KMT and also against uh, some of the, the the history of Republic of China that on Taiwan that's a, a lot of the the, the mainland people of mainland descent still hold precious today. And again, there's I'm not I'm not trying to defend that position because I think there's there's certainly a lot to talk about and it was an authoritarian past that the Taiwanese as a you know, as a collective will still try to you know, come to term with, right? So there is problematic with, you know, wholeheartedly embracing that legacy, right? But it is something that I think, um, you know, the transitional justice project and the, and, and also the, just to get people to talk about like, you know, different traumatic memory and what, what like, the symbols like Republic of China and what the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial means uh, for different communities and for people to see one another side of things. I think that's the right way to go. I mean, I mean, that, okay, I'll, I, I think I've gone on for too long, but that's that's my response to the question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the question now uh, moves on to the first generation and also. Uh, uh, addressing the issue of gender. Uh, Jennifer Chang, research fellow, Global Taiwan Institute, asked, did trauma affect men and women differently for the first generation Mennoners in Taiwan? And how did their identity change or, or not change from Chinese to perhaps both Chi Chinese and Taiwanese? Yeah, okay. yeah great. Um, great question, Jennifer. Um, the, uh, although I didn't really talk that much about gender, uh, in the book, because um, the uh, if you look at the, the mainlander migration, it's a very macho thing. It, that doesn't mean I can talk about gender because certainly, I mean, some of the like the, what comes to mind is the the work by anthropologist Zhao Yanning in Taiwan. She has sort of have gone out and interviewed first generation mainlanders or women, and and actually, to be honest. Uh, a majority of my, over half of my interviewee who who were uh, first generation mainland were actually women, because for the fact that women survive a lot longer than men, when I interview a lot of these people, they're already in their 80s, right? So um, I, you know, and, and I agree with you, uh, women perceive their displacement differently. 
uh, you know, than men, you know, which, and, and when we say the macho discourse or the, the male discourse, a lot of that is connected to the, the state, right? That, of course, this doesn't mean that women, uh, you know, given in that circum, you know, given that circumstances, um, their lives and their perspective weren't connected to this. They were just connected to the state in a very different way. And I do, you know, just to give you a little, like I said, I, I, admit that if you read the book, you, you, you will say that one of the shortcomings of the book is that definitely it, this is an area that's not that, ex, you know, sort of explore. But I will point to two areas in which the, the first one being when I talked about uh, the early 1950s, I said that, you know, because of this displacement, you do, although that's not the main point of the argument, I, I, I did say that uh, women writers because they're now in displacement, they're separated from their family, and this sort of maybe not from the the, the male patriarchy, because the nationalists construct their own kind of you know father and son male patriarchy, party patriarchy in Taiwan. But there is, in a sense, women exile writers negotiation with that and that dynamic, and they have created stuff in 1950s Taiwanese literature that are really interesting and worth reading, right? And that's one aspect. And then the other aspect, I think, deals with the Taiwanese part, because, and this is also in the 1950s, there is a section in my book in which I talked about um, the mainlander uh, female, uh, male employers engagement with their native Taiwanese uh, maids that they introduce in their into, and it's quite a social phenomenon in the 1950s, when you have so many single men with some moderate means to hire, because labor was, was kind of, you know, not, you know, not, it was not expensive, they can afford it, right, but you just, they just couldn't find mainlander maids because there's so few women that have migrated, especially women of lower status that have, were able to migrate to Taiwan. So then you do have to introduce a lot of um, Taiwanese female and you were, you're talking about linguistic and cultural differences on all kinds. They, they have, they, there's this entire literature of, uh, of main, of course, you know, we're talking about discrimination. We're talking about writing of women. There are, you know, that's mix of um, ethnic and both gender discrimination <laughs> on the part of the ma the male um, writer, Minglander writer. But I mean, that's I I I was only able to talk a very like there's a section that I talked about, but that's something that I want to really develop into uh, maybe article article links project. So again, um, thank you very much for that question. I, and I, I, and I do think that uh, there should be more exploration of, you know, if people are serious about this history, that's certainly one area that one can go into in, in more further uh, detail. Okay. All right, so so I'm really curious about uh, the the art archival materials that 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 they employ while conducting the research, and I, I think the next two questions provide us with great opportunities for you to address those uh, aspects. So, uh, friends, uh, friends Guo, Guo uh, who is an ESIA uh, alumnus, uh, thank you for uh, laying out experiences of Wai Shenren in terms of trauma not properly understood by many in Taiwan. And uh, friends ask, uh, in your research, did you find that mainlanders often having few relatives on, ta uh, on Taiwan and employed in government roles during the initial phase were also more vulnerable to being accused of communist com association during the white terror per period? Yeah. It, it, again, this is this is such a great question because like I think that's exactly what a uh, chapter a section in a chapter part of my book shows, and it's it has to do again like this is you know pe you know sort of pitted uh, memory like history the actual history against sort of conventional memory right or the conventional because the, the dominant um, sort of memorial regime in Taiwan, especially after democratization is, you know, this real, very black and white picture of the mainlander rule of the Taiwanese and then 
but you know, if you look at the situation in 1950s, the nationalists really rounded up a lot of mainlanders um, because it's not about you know who you are. Like you know, like I said, the idea of the mainlander as a group and they're affiliated with the nationalists. That's a very that's a later day development. It's an uh, argument in the book. It's about it's a historical process, and then part of the process process at the very beginning is you know, and you're absolutely right. They're they're extremely vulnerable because you know because the way in which uh, the mainlander population got to Taiwan, <laughs> the, the government collapsed, and there were in, even the Taiwanese authority, the uh, the provincial authorities in Taiwan didn't collapse. They have a lot of difficulties tracking like refugees coming, the refugees usually came in with government government unit or the army, right? If you look at the Nationalist Army coming in on Bo, you see, I mean, a huge number of them were like, did they look, what seems to look like civilians and the, the families of of these soldiers, but sometimes you don't know, like even people in uniforms, they, and this has to do with the way in which the civil war was fought. It was extremely traumatic and very disrupting and you know and people take on other people's identities right and there were people being captured by the national drafted in the national army and captured by the communists and then and they fought for the communists and they come back to the being captured by the nationalists again so um so in the 1950s when the nationalists assessed the situation in Taiwan they really didn't know who you are like if you are and the 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 mainlander population from China a lot of them you know came under very you know special very strict suspicion is like because you you might be communist spies right we know the japanese have clear up the taiwanese communists the taiwanese communists during the japanese colonial period was such a small force but then even if you look at all the a lot of the taiwanese who were to join the these left-wing reading groups and were organizing they were usually after 1945 influenced by these radical intellectuals coming from Shanghai, coming from these major cities in China, right, that have infiltrated the, Taiw the Taiwanese universities. So of course the nationals will be targeting especially people coming on, on China, from China who they thought will be, you know, who they weren't, like you are not a sort of party member are you, or you are a party member, but we want to know about your past, what sort of people that you sort of associate yourself. So there were a lot of, and because people ask me, like when you look, if you look at the numbers, the actual numbers of the white terror cases that we know of, you know, from the, the Justice and Reconciliation Committee, you, you see that the mainlanders represent about 40% of the total people like, Con being convicted of like political, like they are political prisoners, like put in Lu Dao and Jing Mei, uh, you, and you'll say, well, still mostly Taiwanese, yeah, yeah, still, still over fifty percent Taiwanese, but mainlanders like forty percent or something, and and you see that all the almost all the mainlander cases concentrated that in the years from 1950 to 1955, and forty percent, that's a that's disproportional because the mainlander population only constitute 10 10 percent of the Taiwanese population <laughs> right so anyway yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that that's that's a really good question yeah all right uh so our next question is from uh professor Patty Chu mm -hmm. who is a, a professor teaching uh, in English literature at uh, GW so she asked uh, whether you could talk a little bit about your sources. Mm -hmm. um, did you do a lot of interviews with people of these two uh, or three generations? And if so, was it difficult to do these interviews? Uh, she's interested in the work of the witness uh, who is listening to her a survivor's testimony. Yeah, <laughs> good question. Um... I think listening to survivors' testimony is definitely very important. Um, I understand where that tradition comes from. Um, Kathy Carruth, um, the and, and you know psychoanalysis, psychoanalytical notion of trauma, um, which I sort of problematize <laughs> in in the book. Um, like and but problematize not in a way of uh, totally rejecting that. Um, that position, um, 
Of course, um, I, I, you know, in terms of sources, I, I started out with a lot of interviews, just like everyone else. And I also read like tons of oral history because they're just so much that's been sort of produced after Taiwan democratized. If you go look at, you know, and they're also involved, they're, they're usually in volumes like, you know, the history of this Jensen community. And then you then you go into the volume, right? There will be people talking about, you know, the individual individual person and families talking about how they got, you know, from the, the first generation got from China to Taiwan. And there's certainly a lot of trauma in it, right? And, but the reason, the reason why I, and like I said, the, you know, the, it's important to be empathetic is in, it's important to respect the voice of the witnesses and you know I, I, I do um, I, I trust that if you read that entire book you see you know like like trouncing witnesses is not my my intention but then I think and this really comes back to the earlier point I made about my subject position and also for historians to when when we want to do um, history um, to to look at because I, I can just give you an example, like um, I've never seen any contemporary accounts of mainlanders talking about their trauma of the civil war and displacement talked about the they won't talk about their effect on the Taiwanese society socially. I'm not talking about politically because politically that's the state. The state is the one that doing the the white terror and everything. But what I mean is socially, like if you look at, you know, the, the thing is, you know, you have an island of 6 million people and that island in 1945, 47 is not particularly rich. It ha has already been sort of uh, plundered because yeah yeah I you know some people don't like the word plunder it's like well it's controlled by the central government central government China is fighting a civil war you have to all use all your resources and the central government did that to all provinces or regions under its control right it doesn't really just exploit Taiwan exploit every provinces um, but then so so by the time the mainlanders the a collapse regime and all these refugees got to Taiwan. The Taiwan didn't really have the Taiwanese society didn't really have the ability to absorb these people. And there's a huge amount of social destruction that's caused by you're talking about what more you know, a little bit more than one million people move into an island of six million. That's already in itself. If you think in today's term, like any country that even the countries that are well prepared, you know, to 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 accept that proportion of the of the of the popular you you see how traumatic that i talked about that trauma as well the trauma for the local society i said there are two social traumas of the exodus the for the migrants themselves it was extremely traumatizing and they will talk about that experience but then i said that you know in historical terms you know if you look at the whole picture there's this other trauma that's created by by this displacement and that's the local population and um, to be just to be more specific and this really reflect on the methodological point that people want me to talk about the if you look at the archive uh, recently like in recent years um, there were a lot of uh, archival sources being released of, and these are military core files people executed by the state in the 1950s. And you can understand, like, understand why, because Tsai Ing-wen's government wanted to do transitional justice, right? And so, but if you look at these files, right, there are two, I, there are two different types of files. One type is, like, it's obvious that these Taiwanese or these mainlanders, they were shot for, for organizing reading groups, for being like suspected being communist be, or being anti-government, right? But there were other type of cases, this other group, which is, I think that group is larger than, I haven't seen the whole dossier, but because the files are still being declassified and, and, and as we speak, but I think that one is bigger. Do you know what those cases were? Military personnel being shot for robbing the local population and raping local women. And that problem was particularly serious from 194 about young taiwan about 1948 from 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 you know about 40 52 53 and i mean if you look at some of the cases it's unbelievable like i just uh, read the i i gave a talk at nccu yes uh, 
a week ago and I used several of the cases. In one of the cases, you see four soldiers from an Air Force unit. They just walk. This is this this was in like 1950 or 1940. They just walk to a theater in Tainan City, filled with people, and just lob a grenade because they want to rob that entire theater. That when people were escaping and just uh, getting out of the exit, they just rob people blind. And you look at that, you're like, what sort of people will do that? Well, the kind of people that were in China at the time that lived through all these decades of warfare, and this is, they're the product of the, that's, that's how they lived through the war. And they continue that behavior on Taiwan. And for the, for the first couple of years, it was a real problem. And if you talked about the, 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 the trauma of the 228 and, and all that, the, the period before, of course, that's extremely traumatic. But I will argue that this is also very traumatic. And this effect is a lot larger if you look at the number of people that came in the, and the number of people who roamed the streets, right? And like I said, um, this is the difference between traumatic memory and the, the kind of trauma they also produce, but they won't tell you. They won't, but you can you can discover bar by archival research. So so I guess that just give you a picture of what what I'm doing. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm doing I'm using other archival sources, social survey data, um, newspapers, like I say, magazines, and anything that I police records, anything that I you, you know, like I said, not to just you know poke at the mainlanders saying that because like i said i think it's very important you know at the same time because to respect people's subjective experiences that is your experience right but historians you know for his for the historians of memory as far as to to you know you know i don't want to you know for me i i don't particularly want to show these experience because when i was sitting there and listening to them telling me about how the, some of the stories and how they got out of China. I, I literally, like I talked about in the book, I literally just, you know, want to cry there because it was just so horrible, really just so horrible. But we have to, to know that sometimes it's exactly these traumatic experiences and it's also the reproduction of it, you know, through the generation that makes it so difficult for people who, the late, later generation that inherit these these traumas to be able to not be able to understand that that the trauma that they also created that's the thing that's why it's so there's just so that many militant Jews in the Jerusalem today that they can't see that their own occupation of you know Palestine and that's how in how much injustice that was because for them the the, the traumatic thing is the Holocaust they're the victims not not the Palestinians so if you can understand what I'm talking about here okay okay so sorry to go on and on for such a long time yeah but that's 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 my response but but thank you very much Professor Chu yeah Thank you. Really appreciate uh, the, the last part of your remark really demonstrate, you know, uh, uh, how to, to maintain uh, that spirit of, of being emphatic while uh, conducting uh, uh, in-person uh, interviews. I, we are, uh, it's 8.45, even though there are still so many questions that we would like to ask, uh, I'm afraid that we will have to uh, uh, to conclude here. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Yang again for your really thought provoking, uh, a, a wonderful talk, uh, and, and that that made us think really uh, think rethink about our our, our uh, conventional understanding of that significant uh, period and that period that has, uh, you know, uh, before uh, never being seriously uh, addressed uh, and, and reevaluated. So if you are uh, interested in uh, purchasing uh, Dr. Yen's book, I will be asking uh, our um, staff members to post the link. I know Adam uh, posted the link before, but we would like to to uh, share uh, that link uh, to uh, for, for you to uh, retrieve uh, uh, information of the book again. Uh, I also want to just just take one minute um, to to share with you uh, an event uh, organized by Secret Center for Asian Studies 
uh, titled Shedding Taiwan's Invisibility Cloak, um, well, um, which will take place on Monday, uh, this Monday, uh, December 6, 2021, 8 p.m. Uh, to, well, actually, it's a, a uh, yeah, 8, 8 p.m. to uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So um, in this talk, there will be a deputy representative from the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Representative Office uh, to share uh, some uh, thoughts uh, uh, with us. So uh, do, uh, and, and here you got the link in the chat box, okay? So make sure that you are SVP in attend the event. Uh, for Taiwan Studies Initiative, we also have some uh, very good uh, programs lining up uh, in uh, next semester. So make sure that you subscribe to our email list so that you uh, can receive uh, all the, uh, it, 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 the information of the upcoming events. All right. Uh, thank you again. Uh, for participating in the event and, and uh, well, please let's give uh, Professor Yang uh, another uh, round of applause to thank him for this wonderful talk and for really taking, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking out uh, really, uh, this is uh, his sabbatical year. So he's generously spending time with us. Really, we really appreciate it. Thank you. We will conclude okay. our event here.